peace. We can be still and enjoy the peace that only God is able to give us. Amen. I'm reading from the 11th chapter of John, verses 28 and 29. John 11, 28, 29. And when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary her sister secretly, saying, The Master is come and calleth for thee. And as soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. It was a very sad day in the little home in Bethany. Lazarus had died. Mary and Martha, his two sisters, had no father and no husbands. Now their brother was gone. They had loved him very much. And of course, he had loved them as well. They had also depended on him, apparently, for to make a living for this little family. Jesus loved this family and they loved him. Now Lazarus had, was gone. Mary and Martha's hearts were broken. And Jesus did not come readily. He knew that Lazarus was sick. But uh, he came later. And we hear Martha's accusing statement when she said, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus, of course, knew Lazarus was sick. But he had delayed his coming deliberately. I think uh, Jesus delayed for at least two reasons. First of all, he wanted his friends to learn the lesson of sweet sorrow. Nothing tenders the heart like the loss of those we love. Nothing mellows us so thoroughly, so completely as the sorrow. I've known folk who had apparently grown calloused and hard. That in the time of sorrow the hearts were melted. Somehow or other they, they had become as gentle and mild as little children. I really believe that uh, Jesus wanted his friends to learn that great lesson. that comes in the time of sorrow. But there's another reason too, and I think it was that he wanted to demonstrate the glory and power of God by seeing Lazarus raised up from the grave. We find here that Jesus joined the sisters in their sorrow, the Bible says Jesus wept. I'm inclined to believe that if we we'll let him, he's always with us, even today, in our times of sorrow. I'm inclined to believe that when we weep, he weeps with 
Tacitus. How often we feel that God has forsaken us when we leave, lose those who are the dearest and best in our lives. But it is a glorious thing here how Jesus explained to Martha that he could give life to those who are dead. That is true physically. It was true in Lazarus' case. But how much more glorious it is to know that he can give life to those who are spiritually dead. Dead in trespasses and in sin. Give new life. And life that is eternal. Then, after Mary, Martha was assured and comforted, and only Jesus can do that. Only Jesus. In that time of bittersweet sorrow, only the Lord Jesus can give assurance and comfort. And after he had so comforted and reassured Martha. She ran to get Mary. And said to her. The master is come. And calleth for thee. Anyone who is at all familiar with the Bible. Is aware. That the Lord. Is always calling. Mm -hmm. The Lord is always calling. If there is one without Christ, one who has never uh, come to know Him as their personal Savior, as their Redeemer, as Lord, He is constantly calling. He is constant calling for thee. For that person who has been saved and not the joy of salvation, but somehow or other has uh, fallen by the wayside. We call it backsliding. That person whose, whose heart has grown cold. Not a fire like it was the day they trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. But they have somehow or other fallen away and backslidden. He's calling for thee. He's constant calling. For thee. Come unto me and be saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God. And there is none else. My prayer this morning. Is. That all. Who hear the master calling will respond as Mary did. <clears throat> if you're here this morning, the Holy Spirit has laid it upon your heart that Jesus is calling, that He would have you come to Him and receive Him as your personal Savior. Trust Him as Lord and Master, Redeemer. I'd have you respond as Mary did when the Bible says that she quickly arose and came unto him. How often men and women and boys and girls will hear the call, know that the Holy Spirit has laid the call of Christ upon their heart, but want to defer, want to put it off, want to uh, uh, choose as Cornelius did uh, not as Cornelius but as uh, 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 well, one of the kings I forget his name 
sit at a more convenient season. I'll call, call for thee. Want to defer, put it off. My friend, Mary gave the ideal response when the Bible says she quickly arose and came unto him. If you're not a Christian, if you've never been saved, and the Lord called you this morning, the quicker you can come to him and trust him as Savior, the far more joy and more readily you will have that joy. The Bible calls from the time God came walking in the garden in the cool of the day and calling Adam, where art thou? He's been calling men and women, boys and girls. What you say? There, there are many ways that God calls us. Um, I certainly cannot name all of them, but I would like to share a few of the ways that God calls us. Always tenderly. I like that song, that one of our hymns, uh, tenderly calling. He's always tenderly calling. But first of all, God calls us through the Bible. In Isaiah 118, he says, Come now, and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Let us reason together. You know, God does not call us to do anything unreasonable. Is there anything more reasonable in, 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 in all of your thought processes, in all of your catalog of memory, is there anything more reasonable than coming to Christ and receiving forgiveness for your sin? Is there anything more reasonable than asking for eternal life? Come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. It doesn't make any difference how great a sinner, though your sins be as scarlet, they can be made as white as snow. Though they're red like crimson, he can make them as wool. And God literally pleads, pleads with us in Isaiah 55, 1 and 2, when he says, Ho! Oh, Everyone that thirsteth, come you to the waters, and he that hath no money, come you buy and eat, yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. He's paid the price. He's paid the price. There's, there's no check that we have to to pay it's all free heaven has loaded the table with the good things of heaven and all we have to do is come and enjoy just come and enjoy and then of course the prophet Ezekiel literally pleads uh, with all who will be saved when he said as I Live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Isn't it amazing that so many men and women, uh, even boys and girls, think that God is just out there to punish us. When we trip and fall, when we sin, then God is anxious to punish him and to destroy him. Oh, what an erroneous picture of our Lord that is, my friend. How wrong altogether that is. 
His heart is grieved, yes, when we sin. When we stumble and fall, His heart is broken, but He's there to lift us up, to take hold, and to bless, and to restore. As I live, saith the Lord, I don't have any pleasure in the death of the wicked. An ungodly, unbelieving world out there, thank God, is just waiting to send us to hell. Not so, friend. Not so. If there's anything that we underestimate, if there's anything that we do not com uh, fully uh, comprehend, it's the extent of God's mercy and His wonderful grace. I want to tell you today, there's nothing you have done but that God still loves you and seeks to reclaim and redeem. As I live, saith the Lord, I have no pleasure at all in the death of the wicked. Why? But that death, but that the wicked turn from their way and live. God is not out there to bring death, but to bring life. And of course in the New Testament, Jesus said, Come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. I'll give you rest. There's no reason to live in all of the stress and heartache that this old world would heap upon us when we have such a source of comfort and rest and peace. Come unto me. I'll give you rest. And the Bible closes with that wonderful appeal in Revelation 22, 17. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Let him that heareth say, Come. Let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him come take the water of life freely. Have you ever, have you discovered that some of the beginning of God's word to the close is one constant invitation to come to Christ. One continual invitation. One call. It's a constant call to come unto me. Come unto me. And then God calls through other Christians. John 1 41 42 tells us that Andrew first findeth his own brother and brought him to Jesus. First findeth his own brother Simon. Oh, what would the Christian community be without Simon? He first findeth his own brother Simon and brought him to Jesus. And then the Bible tells us that Philip found Nathaniel and brought him to Jesus. That's the process. That's what we're to do. Everyone who has been bought with the blood of Christ becomes a missionary. Everyone is to be a soul winner. If you've never sat down and witnessed to someone and tried to tell them how to be saved, you miss the greatest blessing of your life as a Christian. You'll never enjoy anything more than seeing that person whom you have witnessed to come to Christ and trust Him as their personal Savior. I think sometimes uh, those without Christ doubt that we care one way or the other. I went one time to visit a man and brother, he was I guess in a, within a couple of blocks of our church. I did my dead level best to uh, 
lead him to Christ. I want him to wanted him to be saved. No, I've never met him before, but somehow God lays that burden on your heart when you come in contact with a a, a lost person and you have the opportunity to share with them. And I really pled with him to trust Christ as Savior, but he resisted, continually resisted, and seemed rather uh, cold or callous about it. And I finally, though, uh, pushed it a little farther than I normally do. And I said, my friend, you know, if you never come to Christ, if you're never saved, you never uh, receive Him as your Savior, you spend eternity in hell. You know what He said to me? He said, who cares? Who cares? It broke my heart. Here we sat with churches of hundreds of people. And a man within two blocks wondered if anybody cared. Sometimes I wonder, does our community care? There are folk all around us who are lost. Who are lost. Are we demonstrating that we're concerned about that, that we care. I went back and told my church what he said. I don't know how much good that it did, but I got it off of my chest. There is nothing a Christian can do that is more important to them and to others than bringing someone to Jesus. What could Martha have done more profitable in her life and in the life of Mary than going and telling her that the Master's come and calleth for thee. What could Andrew have done more profitable for himself and for Simon than bringing him to Jesus? Or Philip for Nathaniel than bringing them to Jesus? I started out as a young man with good fortune. Got a pretty good start too. But it wasn't satisfying. I wouldn't give the folk that I've seen come to know Jesus Christ as Savior for all the money in this world. God calls through us through other Christians. And then God often calls through trouble and sorrow. It was in the time of sorrow that God, that the, the Master called for Mary. I've known folk who were whom he called in time of sorrow. A young father called me. I'd never met him before. He'd never met me. But somehow he knew about me and he called me and he said, would you do a service at the cemetery for my little boy? His son had died in infancy. Just the undertaker, myself, and the father accompanied that little father out to the cemetery. It was a quiet ride going out there, coming back. I tried as best I knew to console him and to tell him about Jesus.
They seem to be too much in shock or else resisting the Lord for what had happened to him. I don't know which, but I didn't seem to get very far. There's about two years after that, that same young father called me again for the same purpose. And I went with him. Still just undertaker. Him, myself, and the little casket. There between us on the back seat. in earnest to share Jesus with him and this time he was more responsive God sometimes has to call us through trouble I don't know why many of us will wait for that to happen but when we respond it's just like it was in Mary's case. It's sweet sorrow. There's another time. This time it was an elderly gentleman. I, I didn't know him either. He just called me. Uh, many, many calls of that nature that I've received. Uh, I could not begin to tell you how many. But he called me. I don't know if I'd do a funeral service for his wife. Then, of course, you know, you respond if there's any way you can be a blessing, be a help. So I rode with him in the uh, family car to the cemetery. And I had little to say going out, but coming back to the funeral home. He told me about his wife, said she's a Christian and had been for many years. And I said, I talked to him about himself. He said, no, he had never, he had never become a Christian. He had never, I asked him if he had never, ever been saved and made a profession of faith in Christ. He said, no, he's 75 years old. I said, don't you think it is time do you not intend to go for your wife is gone? Somehow or other, the Holy Spirit took those few words and melted his heart. He said, Pastor, I'll be in your service on Sunday morning. Many have promised me that and have not fulfilled the promise, but that gentleman was there on Sunday morning. On the first note of the invitation, that 75-year-old man stepped out in the aisle, came forward, gave me his hand, and gave his heart to Christ. The Lord sometimes calls us through trouble and sorrow. And then finally, God calls many uh, just through his wonderful goodness. Just through his wonderful goodness. In Romans 2, 4, Paul said, The goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Happy is the man or the woman or boy or girl who recognizes the goodness of God and causes them to want to have a right relationship with him. I've seen hundreds and hundreds of folks turn their lives over to Christ and many of them just came to recognize how good the Lord had been to them my friend God wants to show his goodness to you
He can only do so when you surrender your all to Him. We're going to sing an invitation hymn. If you'd come this morning trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you're coming, renew your vows, rededicate your life, we invite you to do that while we stand and sing God's invitation.